Welcome to a crash course in pediatrics. My name is Dr. Shahid. I'm a general pediatrician and medical educator. CRASH stands for Clinical Reasoning and Analytical Skills with Shahid. The goal of this course is to teach clinical reasoning skills to medical students and residents. This is a series of lectures that will take you through several pediatric cases where you will learn how to critically think through a patient case and come up with a broad differential diagnosis. These cases are intended for educational purposes only and are not intended for actual patient care. The objectives of the crash course are listed here. So let's start our case. In this case, we have a two-month-old infant who presents to clinic with respiratory distress. The mom says the patient has had a cough, congestion, and runny nose for the past three days. Today she seems to be working harder to breathe. Mom can hear her wheezing and feels a rattle in her chest. She has not been feeding as well as normal today. There are no fevers and no diarrhea. She did vomit once this morning after a coughing episode. Mom has been sick with a cold that she got from her five-year-old daughter. Past medical history includes no other hospitalizations. Patient does have eczema on the cheeks. Mom says the patient spits up a lot and always sounds congested and that she has noisy breathing most of the time. The patient received the hepatitis B at birth but does need her two-month shots. There are no known drug allergies. Birth history was normal with a birth weight of 3.1 kilograms. There was meconium stained fluid that required tracheal suctioning at birth. The patient drinks Simlac with iron 4 ounces every 3 hours. She lives with the mother, the father, and a 5 year old sister. Family history includes the sister who has asthma, the father who has GERD, and a paternal grandfather who has emphysema. On physical exam, her temperature is 36.9, a heart rate of 140, a respiratory rate of 52, and a blood pressure of 72 over 48. Her weight is 4.8 kilograms. In general, she does have moderate respiratory distress. Her pulse ox is 92% on room air. On skin exam, she does have some eczema on her face, and you also notice a 2 cm by 2 cm hemangioma on the back. HENT essentially is normal. Lungs, you do appreciate inspiratory strider and bilateral expiratory wheeze. Subcostal and intercostal retractions are noted and air entry is decreased. Cardiac is regular rate and rhythm with a normal S1, S2, but you do hear a grade 2 out of 6 systolic ejection murmur at the left lower sternal border. Abdomen is benign, other than the liver being palpable 1 cm below the costal margin. The rest of her exam is normal. So to summarize our problem list, we have a two-month-old female coming in with respiratory distress and inspiratory strider and expiratory wheezing. She has a history of spitting up, a history of eczema, a history of noisy breathing, and history of meconium stained fluid with tracheal, tracheal suctioning at birth. There's a family history of asthma, and she also has a hemangioma on the back. So in this case, we have a two-month-old female coming in with respiratory distress and noisy breathing. She's found to have some inspiratory strider and expiratory wheezing, has a history of the spitting up, and has a history of being a noisy breather um, uh, almost since birth. So let's go through the differential diagnosis of this two-month-old child coming in with these respiratory symptoms and some noisy breathing and see if we can come up with a cause for the wheezing and the strider that this child might be having. So uh, part of the differential diagnosis uh, um, has to deal with some of the acute issues that could be going on, and this child could have something acute on chronic, and we have to uh, think about that uh, in, this, in this patient. So the noisy breathing that she's been having for a while, um, that could imply that she has something chronic underlying, and now acutely she's been having worsening respiratory symptoms over the last couple of days, um, and more respiratory distress over the last couple of days. So that would mean that she has something maybe acute on chronic. So we have to uh, think about it from that perspective. So let's kind of think of a broad differential diagnosis of, of respiratory distress in a two month old, and then we'll get into some of the more acute things versus more chronic things and how some of the uh, acute and chronic uh, type of processes might uh, play out. 
So uh, uh, a common cause of respiratory distress in a two-month-old um, obviously would be some sort of viral infection and viral uh, type of process. Um, so she could she could easily have some sort of a viral infection and viral process. So she could have uh, something um, you know viral like croup, causing her to have the uh, inspiratory stridor and the respiratory symptoms and the respiratory distress. Um, so that's something uh, that you'd have to consider as well. Uh, along with a viral uh, type of process, uh, separate from croup, uh, she could have something um, like bronchiolitis, uh, where she's coming in with uh, um, uh, cough and congestion and runny, uh, runny nose and uh, respiratory symptoms and has some of the wheezing. Um, so that could be the bronchiolitis and, uh, and the croup, uh, again, could have been more of the strider or there's some overlapping young kids uh, uh, with some of these viral uh, infections that you could have some strider and some, uh, some wheezing uh, as well then. Um, so that's a consideration. Now it's possible that in addition to uh, bronchiolitis that maybe the child has some uh, underlying uh, uh, reactive airway disease that is being triggered by this uh, viral process. So maybe she's got bronchiolitis or maybe some reactive airway disease component. Um, uh, she does have a history of eczema, um, so uh, she is atopic, so uh, it's possible that uh, she's at risk for developing uh, reactive airway disease with some sort of viral type of infection, a viral uh, type of process. So I think these are some of the things uh, to consider early on, on a child coming in acutely with respiratory symptoms, with wheezing and with strider. So these are some of the things that you would uh, consider on the differential diagnosis. Uh, other things that you might consider uh, that maybe get into more uh, kind of underlying uh, uh, chronic type of things. Um, so if she could have some sort of uh, uh, anatomical issue um, uh, where, again, she has always been kind of a, a noisy breather and things. Um, so she might have some sort of coinal uh, stenosis. Um, so she could have some sort of anatomical issue where she just has really narrow um, uh, um, uh, nasal passages and even maybe some coinal stenosis. Um, coinal atresia can present with some sort of respiratory distress and uh, inability to breathe out of your nose. Uh, but that usually would have been diagnosed at birth because uh, typically we'll pass an NG tube or a suction catheter into the nose at birth. And if a child truly has coinal atresia, you would not be able to pass, uh, pass the suction catheter. So it is possible that she has a coinal stenosis so there's some narrowing of that uh, passage, um, uh, um, but you can still pass the uh, suction uh, catheter. So maybe she has some cranial stenosis, um, and that's causing you to have uh, uh, narrow nasal passages and then uh, some respiratory symptoms uh, as a baseline, some noisy breathing as a baseline, but now acutely uh, has some sort of viral infection that's causing you to have uh, worsening respiratory symptoms because of that underlying uh, uh, type of process. So I think that's something to, uh, to consider as well. Now you can have other uh, underlying uh, type of issues, anatomical issues that again can be exacerbated by a viral uh, process. So a very common one uh, that kids will have is uh, uh, laryngomalacia or, or laryngotracheomalacia. So laryngotracheomalacia um, is a common cause of respiratory symptoms and inspiratory stridor in infants. Um, so basically you have an underlying anatomical issue um, where airway is floppy um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the larynx or in the uh, trachea. So on inspiration, um, that floppy airway actually closes um, um, when you generate that negative uh, uh, intrathoracic pressure, it, uh, it causes collapsing of the airway um, and you have an inspiratory stridor. So that's actually a common, a very common cause anatomically of, of inspiratory stridor and noisy breathing in infants. Um, they can have laryngomalacia or it could be further down in the airway in the trachea or they can have a combination of laryngo uh, tracheomalacia. Um, and uh, typically uh, these kids, uh, they have worsening strider um, when they ha are generating stronger intrathoracic or negative pressure um, when they are sucking on a bottle or they are crying, um, their strider and their respiratory symptoms might be exacerbated by that. And a lot of times when they're uh, lying in the supine position, uh, that can worsen it as well. So many times putting them in the prone position can help with uh, uh, some of their strider and some of their symptoms as well. And then when these kids have underlying malaysia, they have an underlying noisy breathing, but then when they get an acute viral infection on top of it, um, that can exacerbate the symptoms and can really exaggerate their strider and their uh, worker breathing, uh, given their underlying malaysia that they might have. So that's something to consider in, uh, uh, in young infants. Uh, typically they will outgrow the malaysia by around nine to 12 months of age. Um, and uh, you don't really need to do anything for it. And uh, usually gets better uh, on its own and they usually outgrow it. So basically again, uh, the airway is floppy uh, in 
in that in the, in that area, causing you to have a collapse uh, of the airway upon inspiration. Um, again, uh, something that is commonly seen in kids, so that's something to consider in this type of infant uh, uh, as well. Um, and then other kind of I guess anatomical type of things or things you could be born with um, include uh, subglottic. Uh, type of issue. So uh, you can have uh, a subglottic hemangioma. Um, that's uh, something that you can consider as well. Um, so you can actually have uh, a hemangioma um, that is in the subglottic area causing external compression um, uh, on the airway, causing you to have uh, chronic respiratory issues and chronic noisy breathing and uh, uh, acute exacerbation uh, when you are sick with a viral type of process. Uh, now, about 30% uh, of kids who have subglottic hemangiomas um, actually will have some sort of cutaneous hemangioma. So our child does have a hemangioma on, uh, on her back. Um, so it is possible that she has a subglottic hemangioma causing these symptoms as well. And just like hemangiomas on the skin will initially grow in the first few months of life before they start to involute, um, subglottic hemangiomas will also grow in the first few months of life uh, before they involute as well. So it's possible now that two months of age that this hemangioma is starting to get a little bit bigger and is growing um, and is causing worsening of uh, um, compression on the trachea and more respiratory symptoms. So that's uh, a consideration in this child as well. Um, other subglottic things you can have, um, you can have uh, subglottic stenosis, um, and subglottic stenosis can be congenital or acquired, um, so you have a, a, a narrowing of the subglottic area, um, and it could be congenital, so you're born with a stenosis, um, or it could be acquired where uh, uh, due to some sort of like traumatic intubation, um, uh, that can cause some uh, scarring and uh, stenosis in the subglottic area as well. And we know our, our infant was, uh, um, had meconium at birth and did require tracheal suctioning, uh, so it's possible that maybe there was some uh, trauma uh, at, uh, at the time of, of the suctioning uh, um, at birth, and maybe that led to some scarring in the subglottic area and some subglottic stenosis, uh, acquired subglottic stenosis in that situation, or again, it could be a congenital uh, uh, as well. Then. Um, also related to uh, birth trauma, in addition to acquired subglottic stenosis, um, you can have vocal cord paralysis. Um, so that's something that can occur related to, uh, um, uh, let's see, paralysis related to birth trauma um, and stretching of the neck uh, during, uh, during birth trauma. Um, and that can cause a vocal cord paralysis as well. So I think that's something that you have to consider uh, um, as a possibility of this child uh, uh, as well, um, uh, given the chronic noisy breathing that the child has, but now maybe has something acute on, on chronic uh, potentially as well then. Okay, uh, another uh, type of uh, thing that you have to think about now, she does have a history of uh, reflux, so so GERD, so uh, gastroesophageal reflux, can definitely give you kind of noisy breathing, chronic congestion, uh, because you always have like formula coming back up, um, so that can definitely cause you to have uh, kind of congestion and, and, and chronic uh, noisy breathing and things. She does have a history of reflux, so that is something that you would uh, consider uh, uh, as well is, uh, uh, is reflux. Uh, other things that you might consider is like a TE fistula. Um, so maybe she has an H-type uh, uh, fistula, uh, where again, uh, uh, she's chronically aspirating into her lungs and is having like noisy breathing and congestion and things, um, and wheezing and things as a result of uh, some uh, chronic aspiration. So it's possible she has uh, a T fistula causing uh, that as well. She's a little bit young, but you might think about other things like a foreign body. Um, that's stuck uh, either in her uh, trachea uh, or in her esophagus causing compression on the trachea. Um, she does have a five-year-old sibling, so maybe the sibling was you know, giving her an M&M or a peanut or something and maybe the child aspirated and it's in her airway um, uh, or it's actually something's lodged in her, uh, in her esophagus like a coin. Um, uh, uh, kids commonly will swallow coins um, and then they can uh, uh, be stuck in the esophagus and cause external compression onto the trachea. Uh, so maybe uh, given the sibling that she has, it's possible that uh, there's an issue with, uh, with a foreign body of, uh, of some sort. Um, so these are some things that you would uh, be continuing to consider uh, on this uh, on this child. And then uh, as we're talking about compression, we mentioned foreign body, but there's maybe a few tumors that you might think about as well. So neuroblastoma um, or a teratoma are a couple of uh, uh, considerations as well, or uh, like a, a T-cell, ALL, um, or leukemia. 
so or uh, even on lymphoma, all of these things can cause external compression uh, on the airway as well, especially if they're mediastinum in the anterior mediastinum or the posterior mediastinum. Neuroblastoma would be in the posterior mediastinum with teratomas, T cell uh, leukemias, different uh, lymphomas, things like that can be more in the anterior mediastinum, but all of these things can cause compression uh, of the airway and cause you to have uh, chronic noisy breathing and uh, respiratory symptoms as well. Um, so those are some things that you would uh, consider. Um, and then the next category that we think about is going to be uh, a couple of cardiac uh, type of causes that might cause you to have respiratory distress as well. Um, so let's think about what are some of the cardiac causes that might cause uh, that might uh, uh, explain this child's uh, symptoms as well. Okay, so some of the cardiac causes would be um, uh, it could be something just like CHF. Um, so CHF, uh, congestive heart failure, can uh, give you respiratory symptoms, but it also can give you wheezing um, in infants as well. So she's two months of age, so it's possible that she has a VSD um, and has had left to right shunting. Um, and now at two months of age, it's not uncommon for them to have enough left to right shunting that you develop some pulmonary edema. And as a result of the pulmonary edema, you get some of the wheezing and the respiratory symptoms and the respiratory distress. Um, so, uh, um, so CHF is always a consideration on a child with uh, respiratory symptoms as well. Um, in kids under four months of age, um, when they come in with wheezing or respiratory symptoms, I think it's so important to get a chest x-ray on those type of patients. Um, and you're not necessarily doing the chest x-ray to uh, look for like an ammonia or, uh, or an infiltrate or anything like that. Um, the reason you're actually doing the chest x-ray on kids under four months of age with wheezing and respiratory distress is really to look at their heart size to make sure that they are not in CHF. Because sometimes it's very hard to uh, 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 identify a child who might be in CHF when they are coming in at this age with respiratory symptoms. Um, because uh, at around two months of age, um, their heart rate, their normal heart rate might be you know, 120 to 140. Um, so their heart rate is so fast, you might not hear a, a good VSD murmur. Um, or especially if they have like a, a viral infection or bronchiolitis or something uh, that they're coming in with, um, if they're wheezing because of a viral process, uh, then you might not be able to hear uh, the murmur as well. And they might be tachypneic either from heart failure or from like a viral bronchiolitis. Um, so again, uh, you're hearing uh, rapid breath sounds and wheezing, so you might not be able to hear the heart that well to really uh, identify a murmur or anything to suggest uh, heart failure. So I think it's so important to get a chest x-ray on kids under, especially four months of age, coming in with wheezing and respiratory symptoms. Um, again, it's probably just something simple like a viral bronchiolitis or a viral type of process, but um, it's really hard to rule out heart failure clinically, and that's why a chest x-ray is important uh, because their heart rate is fast, their respiratory rate is fast, you might not be able to hear the murmur and actually when you feel the liver edge like in our child um, she has a liver edge that's palpable maybe one centimeter below the costal margin um, now that could be from hyperinflation from a bronchiolitis or reactive airway disease so the hyperinflation is pushing down uh, 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 the lungs and therefore the diaphragm and therefore the liver so you might feel a liver edge but it's also possible that you're feeling the liver edge because a child is in heart failure and has pulmonary edema um, uh, and, uh, and heart failure and that's pushing uh, uh, the liver down as well uh, from uh, from the congestive heart failure. So uh, so that's always a big consideration in young kids coming in with wheezing and respiratory distress is to get a chest x-ray to rule out heart failure by looking at the size of the heart. I think it's very, very uh, important then. Uh, and uh, some uh, another uh, cardiac cause uh, that uh, uh, that you'd have to think about um, that might cause respiratory symptoms, respiratory distress uh, would be uh, something like a vascular ring or a sling. Um, so vascular, so vascular ring or sling. Um, so basically, what this is is that uh, you have uh, uh, an aberrant blood vessel um, that uh, 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 creates a sling or a ring around the esophagus and the, and the trachea. Um, and then, as that uh, blood vessel wraps around the esophagus and the trachea, it causes external compression uh, of both the esophagus and the trachea, um, and that can cause you to have the respiratory symptoms. So when you have external compression of the trachea from uh, from the vascular ring or a sling, um, that it causes noisy breathing and wheezing and uh, you know maybe strider um, depending on the location 
Uh, so that's something to consider as well. So that would be a cause of chronic noisy breathing in an infant, but again, uh, maybe something acute like a viral process that is exacerbating the symptoms and uh, 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 causing uh, uh, you know, worsening of the respiratory uh, distress then. Um, so, uh, so these are some of the considerations on a, a two-month-old coming in with respiratory distress um, uh, acutely, um, but in this child who has a history of, uh, um, of noisy breathing, um, you have to think about uh, some of these other entities as well uh, that might uh, cause them to have an acute and chronic uh, type of process. So acutely, definitely something viral like a, a viral croup or bronchiolitis or reactive induced by a viral process. Um, but then uh, again, if they have uh, some uh, sort of uh, underlying anatomical issue or underlying chronic issue, um, uh, for which they're having noisy breathing, but now acutely is exacerbated by the viral process. You have to think about other things, uh, anatomical things. Uh, and when, the one of the most common ones is the laryngotracheal malaysia, um, and then other uh, uh, subclotic uh, type of uh, narrowing and compression, um, and a few other things uh, uh, like the vocal paralysis, the, the, the reflux. Uh, it, uh, reflux is a common cause of noisy breathing in infants as well. Uh, rare things like uh, malignancies and things, but then uh, cardiac causes uh, are very important to uh, to consider as well uh, uh, in this uh, in this age group. So this is the differential diagnosis uh, that you would uh, think about on a tumult coming in with respiratory distress with some underlying uh, chronic noisy breathing. Um, and now let's see how this case is going to unfold and what type of workup we should do on this uh, uh, on this patient and talk about uh, 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 what we ended up finding uh, on this patient then. So this child, when she first presented, she was seen in the clinic and was uh, admitted for the respiratory symptoms um, with a presumptive diagnosis of, bron of viral bronchiolitis and uh, presumed uh, underlying uh, uh, laryngomalacia. Uh, so she was admitted, was started on uh, albuterol and some steroids and some suctioning. Um, and uh, after a day or two, she didn't really make that much improvement and continued to worsening uh, of, uh, of uh, some of the strider uh, and the inspiratory strider. Um, and then uh, she was switched to some receiving epinephrine from the albuterol to see if that would help. Um, and it, it still didn't seem to be making that much of a, of a difference. Um, so because of her symptoms that continued to persist and get worse, um, she uh, got a chest x-ray. Initially, a chest x-ray was not done on this patient. Um, and then she got a, a chest x-ray uh, um, uh, because of the persistence of the symptoms. And uh, the uh, lungs were, were nice and clear, didn't show any type of infiltrate or pneumonia or anything like that. Um, but uh, there was an incidental reading of a right-sided aortic arch. So usually you have the, uh, um, the, not the aortic knob and the aortic arch on the left side, but uh, on this x-ray, um, it was read as a right-sided aortic arch, um, which was uh, um, an interesting, unusual, and unexpected finding. Um, so based on that, uh, um, uh, further workup uh, was done, um, and uh, actually an ENT counsel was obtained given her strider that she was having, um, and they recommended uh, 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 an upper GI and a barium swallow, um, and they planned for a laryngoscopy uh, at that point. Um, so she then had an upper GI uh, beer and swallow, um, which basically showed some uh, uh, extra, extrinsic compression of the esophagus. So on the beer and swallow, um, uh, she had a little indentation uh, uh, of the uh, of the uh, esophagus, uh, uh, um, suggesting some sort of extrinsic, external type of uh, type of compression. Um, so uh, she ended up going for the uh, uh, laryngoscopy. Uh, slash uh, bronchoscopy and shows some compression of the trachea uh, just above the crina by a uh, pulsatile lesion. Um, so uh, the thought was, could this be a subclavic angioma or could it be something vascular like a vascular ring or a sling? Um, and uh, uh, basically the, the working diagnosis at that point was a vascular ring, given the fact that uh, she had a right-sided right aortic arch, the fact that she had an upper GI beard swallow that showed a little indentation or external compression of the esophagus. Um, and then also because now the bronchoscopy showed some sort of external compression of the trachea, um, uh, with uh, a pulsatile lesion. So, uh, um, so she ended up getting a, a CT uh, of the chest and the neck uh, uh, with contrast. Um, and basically uh, it uh, confirmed that she had a vascular ring and on, on further kind of reading or evaluation of the CT, it was read as a double aortic arch um, with a dominant right side and a small left side. Um, and then uh, those two double aortic arches were joined through a common diverticulum causing an indentation of the posterior tra trachea at the level of the crina. So basically she had a 
vascular ring uh, secondary to a double aortic arch with the predominance of the arch being uh, on the right side, uh, which we saw initially on the, uh, on the chest x-ray. So that was the final diagnosis on this, uh, on this infant, uh, that she actually had um, a underlying chronic issue, um, uh, and that was explaining the noisy breathing and the chronic, uh, maybe kind of noisy breathing, strider and the wheezing, and acutely she probably did have some sort of viral process that uh, exacerbated the symptoms uh, acutely, um, uh, but uh, uh, she uh, again had the double aortic arch, uh, um, uh, that was uh, causing the vascular ring and the uh, compression on the uh, on the trachea. Um, so uh, uh, at that point, she was referred to our cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, um, and then underwent uh, surgical uh, 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 correction of the uh, of the vascular ring. Um, so, uh, so I think this is a, a, a great case that really highlights that uh, um, you have to think about uh, other other causes of strider and wheezing and uh, um, you know chronic uh, noisy breathing. Um, and again, she probably has something acute, uh, something viral, um, but then because it persisted, we look into underlying uh, issues that could have explained some of her chronic noisy breathing and symptoms. Um, uh, initially, it was thought to just have reflux by the primary pediatrician causing her noisy breathing, um, but then. And, uh, upon further uh, investigation, as we think and thought about all these other entities, uh, she ended up having the uh, uh, vascular ring secondary to a double aortic arch. Um, so this case, uh, again, uh, kind of goes through the uh, thought process of a child coming in with respiratory distress and noisy breathing. Um, and again, the goal of the crash case uh, is not necessarily to go into details about each one of these uh, diagnoses, um, but to more think about it from a, a, a critical thinking perspective, a clinical reasoning perspective, and think about how to approach that patient and think about a broad differential diagnosis and how you can use the differential diagnosis and the thought process to go back and read specifically on these uh, on these entities. Um, uh, but again, the crash cases really focus on uh, clinical reasoning and analytical skills uh, to think about a, a, a broad differential diagnosis on the patient uh, that might be coming in with uh, symptoms uh, that uh, are being presented. So hopefully uh, this crash case uh, was, uh, was informative and educational um, uh, and I look forward to seeing you at uh, future crash cases as well.